Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Thanks for joining us for episode 16 of Whelm, The Young Justice Files Season 2. Welcome to the warehouse. My name is Rich, and I'm here with my... It keeps saying not a sidekick. Co-host. I gotta change this thing. <laughs> Co-host Emily. Hi, Emily. Hi, Rich. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website CrashingTheMode.com, on the YJFiles.tumblr.com, and finally at our email address WhelmedPodcast at gmail.com. So we're all agreed. No, we're not. I don't want the two of you risking exposure for me. Instead, you expect us to sit back and let you die? No. Artemis, begin. Deathstroke. Been on duty for 12 hours straight. I need to stretch my legs and I need coffee. Understood. Take over. I'll be back in five. Fresh pod. No, thanks. And with all that housekeeping out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Complications. The release date was February 16th, 2013, just one week after the previous episode. The in-episode date is May 27th through 28th. The director is Tim DeVar, and the writer is Kevin Hopps. So, voice credits. Uh, we get uh, Frederick Tadasior? Tadasiori? I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that. Sounds Italian. <laughs> he is taking over uh, the voice of Deathstroke. And I went to go look for him. His name sounded vaguely familiar. And I was like, oh, I wonder if he's done anything else. <laughs> the guy's done a lot. Go check out his wiki or IMDb. It is chocked full of I, like every show I can think of. In addition to that, he does uh, some of his bigger stuff. He does uh, Soldier 76 in Overwatch. He did the voice of Zeratul, for those of you who played StarCraft. He also did Sergeant Rock and Major Force in Batman, the Brave and the Bold. He's done Hulk in Agents of Smash, uh, etc. There's just a ton. Go check him out. I love his voice. And like many voice actors, he looks nothing like the picture in my head. I, it's just so funny how nobody looks the same. And then, of course, Kelly Hu and Nick Chinlin back as Cheshire and Sportsmaster. All right, let's get on with our mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. In our pre credit scene, aboard the Manta sub, Miss Martian has apparently fully cured Calder's mind. But knowing that Black Manta will kill her as soon as his son is whole again, the two of them, along with Artemis, are continuing to keep up the ruse that he's still in recovery until they can come up with a plan to get McGann out of there. Unfortunately, Black Manta puts an end to their stalling by issuing an ultimatum. If Calder isn't fully recovered in 24 hours, Miss Martian will die. Post credit scene over on the War World. It's always so hard to say. War World. <laughs> Nightwing attempts to find out what happened to his missing team members. Under the control of the Reach, Blue lies and tells him that the whole team was suddenly sucked into a boom tube after gathering in the docking bay and that all of them, along with the Crystal Key, were presumably captured by Mongol or whoever sent the boom tube. The Justice League is now guarding the key chamber in shifts to prevent anyone from reactivating the War World. Green Beetle agrees to take Blue back home, you know, to make sure he's safe, <laughs> while Nightwing remains to investigate the situation further. Back underwater, Cheshire and Sportsmaster successfully sneak onto the Manta sub, and there Cheshire goes off to find and kill Aqualad to avenge the supposed death of her sister, while Sportsmaster is set on murdering Black Manta to uphold his reputation. Meanwhile, Artemis, Aqualad, and Miss Martian put their plan in motion. However, that plan is interrupted by Cheshire barging into the room, which forces McGann to protect Calder and sends the whole submarine into high alert mode. Deathstroke also remotely shuts off McGann's telepathy, cutting off communication between her and her friends. Despite not being in touch with the rest of her team, Artemis sneaks into the control room and attempts to continue with their plan to break McGann out. Sportsmaster is able to track down and confront Black Manta, but a squad of troopers makes his assassination attempt more difficult. Meanwhile, Cheshire locks herself in Calder's room to prevent any outside interference. During their fight, McGann knocks out the security camera, but is knocked out in turn by Cheshire before she can explain what's really going on. 
Calder then drops the comatose act to try and convince Jade that her sister isn't really dead, but Cheshire isn't falling for any of that. We then cut over to the war world, where Nightwing's still investigating the site of the team's disappearance, with some scratches on the floor, a damaged airlock, and traces of Blue's armor on one of Robin's birdarangs all begin to raise his suspicions that all is not as it seems. But back underwater, Artemis is able to find the controls for McGann's inhibitor collar and shut it down, granting her use of her full power set again. But on her way back to Calder's room, Artemis is roped into the fight between Black Manta and Sportsmaster and must face off against her own father while Manta attempts to save his son. Black Manta barges into Calder's room, but is quickly taken down by Cheshire. Before she can kill Aqualad, McGann steps in, drawing Cheshire, Artemis, Sportsmaster, Aqualad, and herself into the psychic plane. There, McGann draws on Artemis' memories and is able to convince Jade that her sister is still alive and working undercover with Aqualad. However, Sportsmaster is still unconvinced. So Artemis convinces him in the real world by using a fighting maneuver he taught her and probably feeling quite satisfied as she kicks him in the face. Love it. I love it. <clears throat> and since she and Aqualad are, are disrupting Manta and the Light's plans, Sportsmaster agrees to keep her secret. His giggle. I'm all about that, or yep. whatever he says. Yeah. Meanwhile, Cheshire and McGann agree to work together, at least temporarily, to keep Artemis safe. McGann allows Cheshire to escape while Calder saves his father before McGann can harm him. Artemis then throws the fight against her own father and has him blow up the control room to cover her tracks. Before Sportsmaster and Cheshire can escape, though, they're stopped by Deathstroke and Tigress. Miss Martian intervenes, allowing the assassins to escape, and holds Deathstroke off long enough to phase through the submarine and escape out into the ocean. Back in Gotham, Jade picks up Leanne from her mom's house and is able to pass along the good news about Artemis. Black Manta informs Savage and the Reach ambassador that Calderon is fully recovered, and over in the warehouse in Bloodhaven, Nightwing watches the broadcast of a United Nations announcement where the Reach Ambassador publicly thanks Blue Beetle for stopping the war world, and Jaime reveals his secret identity on national television. <sighs> Nuts. Yup. <clears throat> Alright, let's do this. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. I love this episode. There's a lot going on in this episode, for sure. The best thing in the whole episode, there's some good stuff in this episode, <laughs> absolute best thing in this episode, Dick taking two minutes to completely suss out a bunch of stuff that happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, I would have that's been fun. super, super bugged if he was like, oh, that's what happened. Thanks, Blue. And then just like <laughs> walked away. But instead, he's like, well, let's Detective get some more details. Training. That's not right. That's not right. That's not right. Also, kind of the implications. I didn't think about this until this watching. The implications that there are nanites left on Robin's Birdarang. Is Blue leaving beetle nanites all over the planet? That That is worrying. That's interesting. Season uh, three? <laughs> season six? They're planting season six. Season ten. Stuff now. Yes. Let's hope. Uh, though that scene, I will say this time through, I kept having to try really hard not to laugh at Jesse McCartney having to, with a serious face, say the word birdarang. Because seriously... <laughs> That's what those well, are called, at least really. They have, so what Nightwing throws are these little discs, these like weighted discs. Yeah. You know what they're called? Tell me. Wingdings. You think Birdarang's bad. <laughs> about the only thing about Nightwing I could do without is the wingdings. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like a, it sounds like a, a chocolatey dessert from Hostess <laughs> or something. It does. Yeah. Season one, I think I referred it to does. them as smiley face bombs. Because that's, what, that's <laughs> what they had them look like. They flashed red and green smiley faces. I, I guess that's Robin, but like Nightwing? Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't it's know, like, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a ho-ho and some wingdings. <laughs> We're a super right. serious discussion podcast here. <laughs> exactly. All right, you got some, you got some good stuff listed. Why I do. You dive in? I, the beginning of this episode this time through, I continued with my ongoing thought this season of, okay, but where's Zatanna? Because they're showing like all the members of the league doing stuff. And I'm like, hey, remember how Zatanna is a member of the league? Wouldn't some protection magic be useful in this situation? Where's mm -hmm. Zatanna? Mm -hmm. And we'll get her mm -hmm. soon, but still. 
I, I want yep. Zatanna's usefulness to be acknowledged all the time. But outside of that, I love the whole plot line with the Manta sub and with McGann and Artemis and Aqualad trying to figure out how to get her out. But at the same time, McGann's willingness to sacrifice herself for her friends at the beginning of this episode, she's like, just let him kill me. It's fine. I'm like, no, that's that's a little troubling. Like heartwarming that you're willing to protect your friends like that. But also like, yeah, let's get McGann some therapy, too. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. I mean, she's she's coming to terms with the stuff that she did. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know. There's a lot we could like. I kind of want to get a psychologist on and just start talking about season two, like in a discussion episode. We just, we need the like, first. How would, you, how would you handle this situation? Can we just, can we get more tie-in comics that are just Black Canary therapy sessions for a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I would read them. Yes. Yes, we can. But outside of that and outside of that, I do want to point out the hilariousness that is the coffee pot guy, because he's in this episode. Yeah. And mm-hmm. the internet My second loves him. favorite thing in the entire episode behind <laughs> Dick Grayson being master detective is fresh pot. <laughs> it's so good. Like, one, it's hilarious. And I love that the internet and like the fandom latched onto it. And, all, and like, you will ask people, like, who's your favorite character in Young Justice? And some people will genuinely say the coffee pot guy in season two coffee with one line. Guy. I love him. Coffee pot. But also, weirdly <laughs> enough, to attempt to make my love of that moment somewhat serious, it's a little humanizing moment for the villain henchman and everything, which is cool. Like, if you look at Avatar yeah. The Last Airbender, they did that a lot. And I appreciate it when you're able to be like, not everyone is an evil mastermind. Some people are just doing a job and don't know any yeah. better. And it's cool, and I like it. Again, when you when your villains are the heroes of their own story, yeah. like the minions aren't just robots. I mean, there's there's a reason they're there. There's a reason they're hired. They might be mercenaries. That's the easiest one to do. But they haven't much gotten into Black Manta's motivations behind. You know, he's a surface dweller. <laughs> why is he down here? And why in the world would you pick a fight with Aquaman in his own element from the surface? Right. But, you know, hopefully they've developed this background thing. But in the comics, as I I think I may have mentioned before, in the comics, they don't have a good definition for Black Manta's motivations anyway. (laughs) So I'm interested to see maybe what the team has come up with. But, man, when you get Coffee Pot Guy in there, you're just like, oh. Poor dude. Man. Poor dude just wanted to share coffee. Yeah. It had been worse if he had, like, they'd given him a name. (laughs) And, like, like if she had walked by and said, "No, no, thanks, Bill. And like, you know, walked off or. Yeah. No, you know, that's true. Yeah. And then that you're like hurt. wondering like what books are in his bunk and is he like you know, reading series. like like Tale of Two Cities or something. And then, you know, the next scene he's getting. No, he's reading Shakespeare. This is a Greg Wiseman show. <laughs> right. He's reading the, the mysteries of Adolfo. <laughs> Again. It is. <laughs> it's the only book that exists in the Young Justice universe. <laughs> it's right. That's right. All right. Well, let's get back. Let's get back to the old Croc family. I love them. They're real cool. I love. I love the relationship between everybody in this family and how they all sort of hate each other, and some of them love each other, and it's great. Because Cheshire is so. It's complicated, but it's great. Because Cheshire is genuinely invested in this, and is genuinely invested in her sister because she loves her as much as their relationship is weird. Cheshire clearly cares about Artemis, and that makes me happy. Because they're siblings. They care about each other. It's great. And the scene where when they find out telepathically that Artemis is not dead and she immediately calms down, just it war- it warms my heart. Like she goes from like attack mode to being like, oh, you're okay? Okay, good. That's all I needed to hear. Now I will back off. <laughs> and it's, nice. it's just great. Um, in, that same, in that same scene, that moment where, where Cheshire, who... I imagine, like, Cheshire and Sportsmaster clearly both studied martial arts. Yes. They've also clearly studied martial arts from two different perspectives, right? Because <laughs> I see Cheshire, if she's trained with or around, you know, some of the other, you know, martial arts masters in the DC universe, seems to be more connected with her, like, flow and chi and things like that. So she's like, oh, can't you feel your own daughter? And Sportsmaster's like, I don't even, I know you're here and I don't give a crap. (laughs) You know, like, I don't even feel you. 
you know, kind of thing. And it's just, it's so in character for him. And I'm yeah. so glad he didn't like, I, there's so many ways that scene could go that could have been not in character for him. Absolutely. And it was, and also opened up that beautiful door for Artemis to prove to him uh, who she was, which we were all satisfied with. The number of times <laughs> Artemis has kicked her own dad in the head on this show just oh, continues yeah. to rise, yeah. and it's always fun, always. And somehow, and somehow, it never feels like enough. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Because uh, yeah. I, I, oy, oy, oy. I, with Sportsmaster, I also love that him and Jade just can't stand being in the same room together, but are willing to work together for this, at least sort of. And it's just yeah. a really interesting dynamic of being like, I need you around, but I hate that I need you around for this. Yeah. It's definitely an enemy of my enemy thing. Yes. Yeah. And the fact, oy, oy, oy. and everything with Artemis and the fact that Artemis also cares about Cheshire makes me happy. I yeah. love their whole relationship throughout both seasons and I love how it develops and all of that. And I love that yeah. by the end of this episode, we also see that like Jade and her mom are at a point in their lives where they're chill with each other again. And that makes me so happy. Yeah, I agree. And also I noticed in this watching, this rewatching for uh, for our review today, I noticed the thing you pointed out yeah. about little girl is Cheshire. Cheshire. Sportsmaster refers to Cheshire as little girl and Artemis as baby girl. And it's, yeah, so, it's so, yeah. it's so, when you're writing dialogue, that is such a good little choice that they made. Cause like I have mm -hmm. seen, I saw the show so many times and did not pick up on it until a few months back when I did a rewatch for some reason and yeah. noticed it in this episode. And I was like, hey, wait, wait, are you telling me? And like then watching other episodes with them in it, it's true. If you watch the whole series through, it is a consistent yeah. thing that I just appreciate that they were like, this is going to be a linguistic thing that he does. And I like it. Yeah. It, it's super like, God, there's so much wrapped into that. Man, should just get Quinn or his brother, Natai, on the show again. It's super dismissive and infantilizes both of his adult children. Yep. But also, it's an interesting tick. It's super condescending. Right? Super condescending and dismissive in many ways. Yet when he says that, it's like he wants to remind them that they're related and like... I, I just feel like there's probably just for them for their entire lives being, you know, grown up, like abused and trained by this guy their whole life that there's like 25 layers of of emotional roller coaster for each of them every time he says those words, you know, oy, yep. oy. and I also love that, like, we get this like moment of family bonding that Cheshire left Leanne with, you know, her mom. Yeah. And then was able to share that good news, you know, about Artemis being alive and, and that kind of stuff. So I, on a similar note, I love the moment and it, it actually just frustrates me just a little bit. But that moment where Cheshire is um, fighting is Artemis, she's I think, yeah, she's like on top of Artemis. She says something about something about babysitting your niece. I, I, only, I was I'm this, only glad you're this alive time because I was, you can babysit your niece now. <laughs> Right. But I was looking at at Artemis's face and there's no reaction. And I was like, oh, did she know? Did she not know yet? Like if she knew before Roy, that's weird. Like, you know, I just want to see if there was some confirmation. <laughs> I did some research on Ask Greg one time and apparently his ruling is that Artemis found out after Roy. But I believe he said she knew before this episode. So she found out after Roy, okay. but knew presumably before she went undercover. Okay. I perfect, believe perfect. if people want to find other information and correct me later, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. Point us to some references. And the fight between Sportsmaster and Deathstroke, <laughs> it was exactly what it, what it should have been. I mean, you just saw, I mean, so I like, I like Manta in concept. Like I want to know more about his motivations, which they've never really clarified, as I mentioned. But he goes, he does a pretty good job against Sportsmaster, but Sportsmaster knocks him unconscious in the first, you know, part of their fight. So you see Sportsmaster really doing well. And then Deathstroke shows up and Deathstroke pretty much just like Sportsmaster holds him off for a minute. But then Deathstroke pretty much just takes him down, pins him and pulls a pistol out and is going to blow him away and shoot him in the head. Like, I'm like, yeah, that's yeah, that's how that should go pretty much. Even with Sportsmaster still being so effective, you know, because Deathstroke, I mean, 
Deathstroke's basically the evil Captain America, you know? <laughs> it's who he is. He was the he was a highly capable like tactician and combatant um in the military before they gave him this serum later. <laughs> like even as opposed to Steve Rogers, like Steve didn't have the training beforehand, right? And now he has all the training and then in addition to giving him like peak to almost superhuman physical abilities. He's got like this healing factor like Cap does in the movies and heightened mental abilities as well. Like he's got the almost like photographic reflexes um, in a way that's like the Taskmaster who's a Marvel's kind of parallel character to him and that kind of thing. So when you're talking about that, it's like, yeah, Sportsmaster is like really good peak f- human physical condition. But Deathstroke was like that before he got the super serum. So... Yeah, but the only thing that really bugs me, it bugs me in this episode in particular just because it happens a lot, but it's happened previously in this in this series, and then it's also happened in some other series I've been re-watching recently, which is armed armored guards just being, like, taken down with a punch to the head. Like, it drives me nuts. Like, you need to go fire whoever made that armor, because that's just, it's ridiculous, like, it happens in, like, Rebels all the time, you know, where somebody will, like, grab two Stormtroopers' heads and smash them together. It's like, their hel- that's what their point of the helmet is, is to not have head trauma to the point of being knocked unconscious. <laughs> it's because animating helmets is easier than animating faces, but we need to take everyone down. I agree. I agree. It's just one of those little things that, oh, please, oh, figure out a different way. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but figure it out. Also, I'm a little bugged by the fact that I don't know, his his Manta soldiers' suits should kind of be insulated. <laughs> so they keep getting electrocuted. I mean, this is this is me with my marine bio gaming thing coming into effect. But those suits, either they're wet suits, which means the inside of them are flooded with water and they need to have like neoprene kind of things to keep them warm, or more than likely, they're dry suits, which means that there's air in between, and I don't know. It just seemed odd. Like, you know, you could be like, eh, it's metal armor and blah, 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 which it shouldn't be because it'd be rusted anyway. I don't know. I got to point it out because it's like, oh, my God. Even Nightwing in that scene on the beach where he's taking down fools with his Escrima sticks, and he's hitting him in the head with his Escrima stick and taking him down, and I'm like, okay, all right, I love you, Nightwing, but seriously, helmets. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say. Do something else. You're questioning armor on a superhero cartoon. They could have. I'm question. I question lots of things on a superhero cartoon. True. But this is it. It's a kind of detail they usually like suss out. I get it. If like okay, if Superboy punches you in the face, <laughs> yeah, yeah, in a helmet, okay, probably your helmet's your head's knocking around inside that thing. I can kind of get that. But when it's like, I mean, Nightwing, Artemis. You know, uh, Sportsmaster's giant mace flail thing that he swings around. Okay, I can kind of see that, you know. But otherwise, man, that armor is just like, is worthless. I don't know, man. I can't, I can't explain away the armor. I can't. Okay. I can't even try. I'm asking your professional armor opinion. I know nothing about armor. <laughs> <laughs> you know nothing. <laughs> Craziness. Yeah, so that fight scene between... Deathstroke and uh, multiple fight scenes like in the whole thing of course had their great choreography like they always do but yeah seeing Deathstroke in action is great it it does make me like there's a lot of Deathstroke's history we'll we'll definitely get a villain secret origins for Deathstroke he's just so complicated and been around for a long time but I wonder if like I'm assuming this is after he got the super soldier serum because he was in one version I think he was a mercenary before he got that and some other stuff too. So, hmm, I don't know. We'll have to see. Hopefully, he'll show up a lot more in season three. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Do you have anything else from this episode? No, no. I think I think it's time to move on. To- hey, is there any um, is there any is there any fan fiction about Coffee Pot Guy? <laughs> I bet there is. Not that I've read, but I wouldn't That's say there isn't. <laughs> Because I wouldn't put anything past this fandom, literally ever. <laughs> there are ships between characters on the show and characters who haven't shown up yet. So I wouldn't put yeah. anything past this fandom. I was just picturing somebody creating a, 
a ship between Artemis and a coffee pot guy that's just called Fresh Pot. That's the relationship shipper name. Give me a second, because now I'm going to find it. <laughs> I'm going to try and find it, because just here, we're going to go off on a little tangent. You never know. It could happen. There is, as far as I can tell, one coffee pot guy fan fiction. <laughs> Neil, nice. can, Neil can just cut all of this out if he wants to, but it's on archive of our own, guys. You can find it by searching for coffee pot guy. Nice. <laughs> it's him and Calder, apparently. Oh, that'd be good. Them having a conversation. That's funny. Oh. Uh, yeah. All right, enough of that. Let's <laughs> let's get on to the debrief. Stick around. Class is in session. Today's Canary Debrief is about keeping characters in character. We've talked about this before in various ways, but this episode, this episode is a complicated episode for that. So this episode includes a fairly complex plot to free McGann. They could have just freed McGann. Like someone could have come to the ship, blown it open, taken her out, you know, shorted out the collar. They could have done a lot of straightforward stuff. But they didn't because they needed to keep Calder undercover and Artemis undercover, and they needed to resolve a a laundry list of other things. So the complexity doesn't come from just freeing her. But in doing so, while trying to maintain all of this cover, as well as resolving the Kroc family personal grudges, and, in my opinion, one of the biggest and hardest things to do in a scene in an episode like this, is making sure the villains like Black Manta and Deathstroke aren't undermined in their believability. If any of this hadn't have been written as tightly as it was, Manta could look like an idiot, Destro could look like an idiot, like it could have been really easy to do. Pulling off this balancing act requires a lot of planning, as well as taking every single character's story down multiple potential paths and drafts to make sure that the actions that they're taking are in line with their personalities and using their powers and abilities at their peak. Like we mentioned earlier, Sportsmaster not believing the mental illusion. He's literally inside a mental illusion being created by McGann. Why in the world would he believe any of it, right? The only reason that Cheshire believes it is part of her probably wants to believe it, but also she's a little bit more empathically connected than the sociopath that's her father, right? Artemis getting to prove her identity to Sportsmaster by kicking him in the face, but also making a callback to the training that she had. Yeah, Making a callback to the training that she had. Again, giving a little developing character for these two. Not just saying that they're related, but showing aspects of how they're related and calling back to their history. Cheshire not believing Aqualad when he first said Artemis was alive. The second thing is believable because the first part was believable. If she had just been like, oh, she's alive? Like, why would you believe Aqualad, who is clearly deceiving multiple people already and has no reason not to lie to you. And they even play with that because she starts, she acts like she believes him and then just like grabs him. Yep. They totally take that TV trope and they kind of flip it on its head for us. So we think that's going to happen, which makes it believable that Calder falls for it. And then they go on from there. So it stays within character while also playing with the tropes. Artemis asking Sportsmaster to blow up part of the control room to cover up that someone shut off McGann's collar. They didn't have to address that at all, right? She was in there. She turned the collar off. You know, she went to go do some other stuff. Like, they could have hand-waved that, and other animated series probably would have hand-waved that and would have just left us wondering, like, huh, would that have left a trail? Would it not have left a trail? Would they have known it got turned off manually or by her? Like, did she have to have sign in for that? You know, like, I don't know. I don't know what. But the fact that they took those little details and added those in, again, builds character and closes as many of these plot holes as possible. Aqualad saving Black Manta from McGann. Him tackling McGann and giving her a reason or excuse to just get out, right? But also allowing, like, later on, Manta says, oh, saving my life is what pushed him over the edge and gave him the kick that he needed, which in Manta's mind, which I almost feel bad for the guy, in Manta's mind bonds his son to him even more. And that look on Calder's face, when when Calder asks him, are you okay? And he says, I am now. It's a complex look. 
it's blank it's it, it's blank and can be read in so many different ways that it's complex. What is Calder feeling in that moment? Like he has a dad. We don't know what his stepdad Calvin Durham is like. We get in the comics, we see him. It seems like he's a nice enough guy. But this is his actual blood father and while the stuff that's been going on all season, it's just got to be so complicated for Calder. And then Destro getting on board when things went south and taking on Sportsmaster, beating him, and then needing McGann to save the situation. There's so much going on with every one of these characters. If Deathstroke hadn't have shown up, I would have been questioning what is happening. <laughs> Why would Deathstroke not get on the ship and stop them? Like, you could have just not done it, and it would have been kind of like, okay. But it's you don't have to hand wave it. You don't have to give yourself your own headcanon excuse for it. They're thinking about every character's actions deeply and putting them into effect at full capacity. It takes time, it takes effort, and you need to think about all of the drafts that you're doing to make sure something like this is tight and that Calder, in this particular case, Calder and Artemis's cover is believably not blown. If not, their links to the villains increased even more, which in this case is what happened. And that's it. Let's get to crashing the mode. Let's go for it. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In crashing the mode, we'll be discussing spoilers for Young Justice and the DC Universe in general. If you're spoiler wary, of course, consider this your warning. Man, the big thing is, is we're starting to really see, in my, in my mind, we're starting to really see this back and forth between the light and the reach. Like... The Reach came to came to Earth because attention was drawn to Earth, you know, and Vandal had set up all of these things. The Light had set up all of these things to get the core members off of the planet, including the Lanterns, right? I'm still not sure why Hal's not there, <laughs> or while there isn't a Lantern on World. Because they haven't talked about the other Lanterns. Where's Guy? Where's Kyle Rayner? Like, these are other Lanterns that could potentially be that is on Earth cool. while... Yeah, while John's gone. And of course, a lantern could answer all the questions about the Reach. So plot-wise, you don't want to have a lantern there. But, you know, I don't know. We'll see. But these backwards and forwards things that they're doing between the two get so complicated. The War World destroyed 60-plus percent of the Reach's invasion fleet. And it came to Earth triggered by Vandal telling Mongol about what was going on. It's like what is what it, who who is doing what and why, right? What it what is their purpose? You know, well, seems like they wanted the war world on Earth so they could control it, which is a great idea. It's also there to because Vandal can't they can't they can't do what they were going to do with the light. They can't improve the human condition theoretically, as their goal seems to be, if the Reach rules the planet and makes everybody submissive. So they want them there to draw attention and to bring these conflicts there and the technology and other things there, but then they don't want them to stay. So uh, it gets even, and we start seeing more and more of that unfolding as as time goes on as well. Y- yes, I agree. I, I'm not sure if there's uh, how much more crashing the mode there is except for that, that their plans just keep cranking forward in motion. And... I think we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the next episode, next couple of episodes, actually, because I talk about that, too, because we start getting into G. Gordon Godfrey and what is his plan going on in the background and who is he and, you know, who sent him and why. Like, we'll get into some of that a little bit in some later episodes. And that's pretty much everything I can think of for this episode. There's a little bit more later on. We're getting close to the end. I know. It's starting to wind up. We have, what, four more episodes to go? Yeah. It's heartbreaking. So just like with the last season, there wasn't as much to crash as we started getting closer to the end of the season because things are starting to zip up nicely, set them up and knock them down. Um, So let's move on to some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. So for this week's fan service, we have a little AMV that I stumbled across. It's just a cool instrumental one called uh, We Didn't Come for a Playdate by Kelso895. (laughs) It's just... Really cool. It's not no little lyrics or anything, just awesome instrumental music over both seasons. So both seasons, there are spoilers, I believe, if I'm remembering it correctly. But (laughs) I would imagine. 
Uh, I didn't actually get a chance to see this one yet. So is there, is it, it's just instrumental music and then cuts of certain scenes? Yes. Are they mostly action scenes or like, what are they? It says not come from a play, for a play date. I assume it's a lot of action scenes. It's a, it's a little bit of everything. It's just the whole team doing stuff. It's just kind of a breakdown of both, of scenes from both these. I added this several weeks ago, trying to remember things as I look at it. It's a little bit of like all of the relationships between everybody on the team, the team dynamic. There's some action scenes. There's some other stuff. There's audio clips okay, of cool. from the show, not just interspersed with the awesome instrumental music. And it's just cool. Gets you pumped. Nice. All right. Cool. Well, we'll have a link to that in the show notes, as we always do. And with that, I think we can wrap up this mission and head out of the warehouse. The best way to support the show is with five-star reviews on iTunes, or I guess they're calling themselves Apple Podcasts now. Fancy. Uh, or your podcatcher of choice. Please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology and buy the show somewhere online until the DC streaming service launches. By the way, speaking of YJ Comics on Comixology, if you follow Christopher Jones on Twitter and Tumblr and everything, he's been sharing a bunch yeah. of cool stuff about how he decided to make the covers the way he did. So like, check those out if you're Ooh. interested in them. He's got like a bunch of early drafts of that stuff that he's been sharing online, and it's super cool. Just wanted to throw that out there because I've been reading a nice. few of them. Yeah, they're absolutely. really interesting to see no, like, that's he, how he fantastic. decided to put who on which covers. He's very cool. Yes. Uh, you can also use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three online. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, more actual play podcasts, and all of the other awesome stuff that we do, please consider supporting us over on Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay wound, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.